Okay, welcome to College Algebra. Yes? Uh, are you going to put in any of the more recent homework? Yes, they'll be put in today. The first one will be due Wednesday. There's nothing due Monday. <clears throat> and the schedule has been modified just slightly. Uh, we were originally scheduled to finish 5-2 today. Rather, we're going to finish 5-1 today. And the schedule will be bumped down. And we'll, I'll update the syllabus. <clears throat> Uh, sometime. <laughs> okay, so any questions before we get to it? Okay, so last time, last time we kind of ended in this position. That we were saying that you could be given a quadratic, f of x is a x squared plus bx plus c. And then the only requirement is that A has to be non-zero. And by completing the square, by completing the square, you could perform a sequence of algebraic operations to get it to look like this, A multiplied by X minus H squared plus K. So you could complete the square to make it look like so. This is useful. This is useful because um, that tells you exactly where the vertex is. Where is the vertex of this quadratic? Yes, it is at HK. And then what is the name of the shape of the plot of a quadratic? Parabola, okay, bendy, the bendy thing. And all parabolas either open up or down. The standard parabola opens up. It would hold water. And then if you were to vertically reflect it, it would open down and it would not hold water. And whether or not this parabola, the, the corresponding parabola opens down or up depends entirely and only on A. So if A is negative, If A is a negative value, then how does it open? Opens down like a frown. It even looks like a frowny face, doesn't it? Yeah, can't unsee it now. And then if A is positive, if A is positive, then it opens up like a cup. And it would hold water. Okay, so then <clears throat> now this position right here, this is called the vertex. It has coordinates h, k, and this has coordinates h, k. And then the parabola is symmetric across this axis. So essentially what completing the square really does, <clears throat> sort of, for those of you who are uh, picture people <clears throat> instead of algebra people, what completing the square does is it's saying that, well, suppose this is the, the xy axis. Suppose this is the xy axis. <clears throat> and that we have the quadra a quadratic that's over here. What completing the square is doing, it's sort of saying that, well, it would be more convenient if the origin was actually at the vertex of that parabola. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to grab the whole, <clears throat> I'm going to grab the coordinate system and just move it over there. So for those of you that are visual people, completing the square is like saying, well, that red parabola is not, I don't like the coordinate system being over there. I'm going to move it to right there. Perfect. Okay. Algebraically, the, the d distinction is it goes from looking like this to looking like that. <clears throat> so now, completing the square is a little bit of a tedious task, a little boring even. So what, what we're going to do right now 
is we're going to come up with a formula so that we don't have to complete the square anymore. Okay? But to come up with that formula, what do you think we're going to have to do? Complete. complete the square. Okay. Well, it's going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> so we want a formula. for h and k. Okay, so to do that, to do that, I'm going to take this expression. So f of x is a multiplied by x squared plus bx plus c. And then when we complete the square, the first thing that we do is we collect all the terms with x and separate them from those terms without x. So that would be something like this, a x squared plus bx, and then we'll separate that from c because it doesn't have any x's. And then when we complete the square, what must be true about the quadratic we're completing? I'm fishing for an m word. Must be monic. Is this quadratic presently monic? It is not, necessarily. What if the a is one? Well, that's what I mean by necessarily. So how can we make sure that it's monic? Yeah, we factor out the A. So my question to you is now, supposing that we factor out the A, then what do I need to write in here? Not quite. So x squared, that term becomes x squared. And then what's the next term? plus b over a, x. Because notice, if you were to multiply this a back in, a times b over a is b, right? So factoring out the a does, does that. <laughs> now, the complete the square trick, in a sense, <clears throat> is, so by the way, the algebraic thing that we've done here, the algebraic thing that we've done here, is equivalent to saying that, okay, this parabola, this parabola was too high. So I'm going to pull it down so that it's sitting on top of this axis right here. Or you could think that I pulled this axis up so that the parabola is sitting on top of it. That's what it means to separate it from C. Then we said that, okay, this parabola doesn't open the way I like it to open. So I'm going to factor out that A. <laughs> okay. Now what we need to do, the last thing we need to do is we need to pull the axis over to where it's aligned with the vertex. So that's what this trick is. So we're going to add zero. That's the trick. But we have to be judicious about it. So what do we need to add and then subtract? Yes, this coefficient, b over a, and then divide that by 2. Why do you think over 2? Because it's always half. Over a. Because, it's, because it's already over a. Oh. So it's whatever, it's whatever this is, you know, it's pencil over 2 squared. Mm -hmm. And if it was a 4, it would be 4 over 2 squared. It happens to be b over a. So this will be plus... b over 2a, so that's b over a over 2 squared, and then minus b over 2a squared. So that red is, is equal to 0. And what that has done is that's now pulled the axis to where it's vertically aligned with the symmetry axis of the parabola. Because... <coughs> these first three terms inside of the square parentheses factor as a square. So this is, what I mean to say is that this is a, and then this can be written as a square, and then minus b over 2a squared plus c. So my question to you is, is what goes in here? So because this is x squared, what goes here? X. x. 
And because this is b over 2a squared, what goes here? b over 2a. Now you might be a little bit incredulous, but how could you verify that this is correct? Yeah, you could multiply it back, back out. And then it's right. Okay. So now we can now we can distribute this back through and say okay. Now, remember what I said about this. If you're feeling if you're currently feeling uncomfortable about this, <laughs> remember we're doing this so that we have to do it this one time. Right? Because we're trying to produce a formula. And what you're going to remember is the formula, the punchline. Okay, so minus a multiplied by b over 2a squared and then plus c. So I multiplied the, I distributed the a into the square parentheses. So now this first bit is done and I'm going to work on just this bit for a moment. So this all, this front part is finished. Okay, so then now, this would be minus a, and then I'll square that and get b squared in the numerator, and then divide by 4a squared, and then plus c. So now do you notice that an a will cancel? So an a cancels. <coughs> so that would be a, x plus b over 2a, square that, and then minus b squared over 4a, and then plus c. And now I want to take these two terms and I want to add them together with a, as, with a, into a single fraction as a, by finding a common denominator. So what's the denominator for this one? What's the denominator for that one? 1. So I could write this as 4ac over 4a. And then now they have a common denominator. And I'm going to put them on the same denominator, and I'm going to factor out negative 1 so that it will look like this. Well, what would you get if you did four if you canceled four A over four A? Right, and then just C would remain. That's that C. Oh, so we do that C. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is neat. So one thing I'd like to point out is that look, B squared minus four A C, haven't you seen that before? That's the discriminant in the quadratic formula. Is it surprising? that the discriminant has shown up here? No. <laughs> no, because the quadratic formula is a consequence of completing the square. And we just completed the square, <laughs> so it's not, it's not surprising. Okay, now, comparing these two formulas, comparing these two formulas, we now have an explicit formula for h and k. Okay, so then now, therefore, we can conclude, what's the formula for h? So it's x minus h. So then what's h? Not quite, almost. Negative b over 2a. h is negative b over 2a. And what's the formula for k? So now you do keep the negative, because that's positive. So the formula is negative b squared minus 4ac over 4a. However, essentially, the only one that's necessary to memorize is this one, h, because once you have h, you can always find k by plugging in that h into f. So really, you only need to memorize one. So negative b over 2a. 
So the, the formula for the horizontal coordinate of the vertex of a, of a quadratic, of a parabola, is negative b over 2a. What is it? Negative b over 2a. So when you're teaching besides being correct, what is the most important technique to impart knowledge? Repetition. That's the most important. What's the second most important? Getting the right answer. Repetition. What, what, what's, the, what's the next one? Okay, now we get it. So I'm going to say negative b over 2a as many times as I can today. And I'm going to try and get you to say negative b over 2a as many times as I can today, negative b over 2a. Okay? So if I was to give you, if I was to give you, f of x is 3x squared minus 18x plus 41, then my first request of you is please put it into standard form. Now, you could do this by completing the square. And there, that would be fine. But there's a far more expedient way to proceed now. Negative b over 2a. <laughs> well, so, yeah, so we know that in the end, if we knew the vertex, then we'd be essentially finished. If we could just figure out the vertex. So the formula for the horizontal coordinate of the vertex is negative b over 2a. And in this specific exercise, what are a, b, and c? Very good. So negative, negative 18 divided by 2 times 3. Well, that's 18 over 6, which is 3. That means that we now know that the horizontal coordinate of the vertex is 3. Amazing. So now, you could also memorize that other formula for the vertical coordinate of the vertex, which is quantity negative b squared minus 4ac over 4a. You could do that. But it's more expedient for you just to say, well, I know that the vertical coordinate should just be whatever I get when I plug in the horizontal coordinate, right? Which is to say, OK, I just need to plug in 3. So rather than memorizing both of those formulas, you can just memorize the 1. So what, what do you get if you plug in 3? Well, that'd be 9 times 3 is 27 minus 54. That's negative 27. And then add 41. Not 12, right? 41 minus 27 is more than 12. Isn't it 14? 14. I'm pretty sure it's 14. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty... It's, it's funny, mathematicians are notoriously bad at arithmetic. Because <laughs> mathematicians are usually only interested that it can in principle be, be done. <laughs> yeah, 14. Okay, so that means that to put it in a standard form, we need three letters. Two of them are H and K. What's the other letter we need? We need A. Well, what is A? It's three. This is A. Okay, <clears throat> so then <clears throat> that means that we have now established that this is, this can be written as f of x is what in standard form? Uh, 3 times x minus 3. Yes. Square, Square that, yes. Plus 14. Plus 14. So now we put it in standard form. Isn't this better than completing the square? Yeah, it's preferable. Okay, next question. So I just want you to think about what I'm asking, but, but no comments yet, please. I want you to find the uh, minimum coordinates. of f, and I also want you to find the maximum coordinates of f. That is to say, 
I want you, I want to know where where the maximum what the maximum value is and where it occurs, and I want to know where the what the minimum value is and where it occurs. No comments. Well, no, three is not, it depends on what you, you have to be specific. So, okay, so then what, what is the minimum value, what is the minimum value that this function can output? 14. 14. It couldn't possibly output anything smaller than 14, why not? That's the y-intercept. That's not the y-intercept. But, it, but. That's that's when x is three. So let's look. So how about for how about how about just this for a moment? What is the smallest that that could ever be? Zero, right? Because you're squaring something. So, so if what you're squaring is positive, then the result is positive. If what you're squaring is negative, the result is positive. So the only time that this thing that's in between my index fingers, the smallest it ever can be, is zero, and that's at three. Okay, and what's the smallest that 14 can ever be? 14, 14 right? <laughs> it's also the largest it can ever be. So what is, the, what is the, the smallest this sum can ever be? 14. Now I claim that that's actually quite obvious because what is this? If you were to plot this, what is it? It's a quadratic and starts at 14. Right, this is the, the, the plot of this is a parabola. Where is its vertex? At 314. How does this parabola open? up like a cup, right? So then this parabola looks like this. So what are the minimum coordinates? The vertex. Yeah, at the vertex. Okay. How about the maximum coordinates? It's not that. There isn't any. It's not infinite. Infinite's not a coordinate. So there's just none. <laughs> there is no maximum. Because, because here's this parabola. How, how high does it go? How far up does it go? All the way up. Right? It's not bounded above in the following sense. You might say, well, a million is a big number. Does this quadratic get bigger than a million? Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> how about a billion? Billion's a pretty big number. Does it get higher than a billion? Yes. Every number that you give me, it gets higher than that. It gets higher than a, a billion billion, which is called a Sagan, after Carl Sagan. <laughs> Billions of billions, okay. So there is none. It's important to know in a, in a math class and generally in a science and engineering class, if you're asked to find something, you need to know when that request is not a legitimate request. You need to know when such a thing doesn't exist. And the reason is because when you're trying to, f anything that you say about, about, about things that don't exist is automatically true. So for example, are you aware? that UT Dallas has won every national championship football game that we have ever participated in. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Why is that true? We've never participated in a national championship football game. We don't even have a football team. So that's, that statement is true. It is also true that every national championship football game that we have ever participated in has been a purple giraffe eating a banana. <laughs> That's also true. It's also true. And it's, so it's very important to establish the existence of objects before you talk about them. Okay, so then the correct response to this question is to say that this object does not exist. Yes? For the x minus 3 uh, squared, mm -hmm. is it the smallest that I could be in? The smallest that it could be is zero. Yes. What if you plug in like any other number? Why don't you get like a negative zero? Well, let's plug in. What if we plug in x is negative 10? Mm -hmm. Negative 10 minus 3 is? 
Okay, good. Other mm -hmm. questions? Yes? If we multiply the, the A times 14, okay. would that change? Are we supposed to? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I, have n I also am not sure what you're asking. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so let's do another one. Okay, so how about, how about if I was to give you the following problem? If I said, so, here's something interesting, is that if you, if you throw a ball, okay, if we, were, if we lived in a vacuum, okay, there was no air resistance, and if also we lived in a uniform gravitational field, which n n neither one of these things is true, but supposing that they were true, if you threw a ball, its trajectory would be a parabola. It would be exactly a parabola. So in fact, in fact, what really happens is that if, say, someone threw a ball really hard, it would not be a parabola. It wouldn't be symmetric because the air resistance would slow it down. So it would kind of look like a parabola at first, and then it would bend down quickly because that's the air slowing it down. Okay. Uh, but even if there was no air resistance, say we were on the moon, which has essentially no atmosphere, if you threw the ball really, really, really hard, you could put that ball into orbit, right? And then it, then it would be a circle, right? It wouldn't be a parabola. Okay. So, so but that's because the, the moon's gravitational field is not uniform. So let's suppose that we're in a uniform gravitational field with no air, air resistance. That means that if we throw a ball, it will be, its trajectory will be parabolic. Okay. So here we go. Suppose that the height of a ball is given by h of t is 16 t squared uh, plus 80t plus 40. Okay. So before we proceed any further, I want to ask, does this pass the reasonableness test? Probably not, because otherwise why would I be asking that question? Yeah, so we've thrown the ball and we measured its height at every time t. So is this reasonable? Well, we could be on a building. We could be on a building and we threw it off, off a building. So it started at height 40. That's, that, so there's nothing wrong with, Shouldn't notice when you plug in t, it's 40. <laughs> okay, so what do you mean? Right, so have a look at this. The horizontal axis is t, and the vertical axis is h. How does this parabola open presently? Up. So this would be like saying that you throw a ball, and then it rockets off into space, right? You just throw it in. Is that, is that how it really works? No, obviously. So, so why is this not reasonable? Yeah, the leading coefficient, in order for this to be a reasonable problem at all, the leading coefficient must be negative. And besides that, look at the horizontal space on either side of the equal. It's uneven. Better. Now the horizontal space is even. Okay, so does everyone see, in order for this question to make sense, the leading coefficient must be negative. Okay. So first question. Uh, so, supposing that the event, so a ball, the ball is thrown at uh, time zero, at time zero, from what height is it thrown? Okay, so now I do agree with that, 
but this is sort of like, you know, an English sentence, and I want to know what is this, what, in the end, what is being requested with respect to, like, make it more of a math sentence. Yes. So evaluate h of t at t is zero. Okay, well, h of zero is 40. So that means, you know, we were standing on a building or a ladder or, or whatever, started at height 40. Okay. Second question. <clears throat> When does the ball reach its maximum height? Yeah. When does the ball reach its maximum height? So can you translate this into more mathy language? Okay. And where does the maximum of a quadratic occur? No, no. At the vertex. So what am I asking for? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I, in the end what I'm asking for is I want you to find the horizontal coordinate of the vertex. What was the formula for the horizontal coordinate of the vertex? Okay, that's, that's at least twice now, right? <laughs> Maybe three or four times. So H is, thank you. <laughs> so H is negative B over 2A. What are, what are A, B, and C in this specific problem? Okay, very good. So this would be negative 80 divided by 2 times negative 16. The negatives cancel. That's 32. There's 2 and a half 32s in 80, so that's 2 and a half. So, the, I, didn't, I didn't write it down, but the story said that this is in feet and seconds. So what this means is that, why is what? Okay. So, um, it's in feet and seconds, so at two and a half seconds, the ball reaches its maximum height. Notably, what do we not currently know? K, and what does that represent in the story? Well, that's how you get it, but what does it represent in the story? The, the, ma the maximum height, right? So presently we know that, well, whatever its maximum height is, we know that it is achieved at two and a half seconds. So what's the next question? Yeah, what is the maximum height? Okay, so then to, to say it in more mathy language or geometry language, what is it that I'm asking? So, well, yes, that's analytically, but like I want you to say a statement like this one. Yes. Find the vertical coordinate. Coordinate has two O's in it. of the vertex. So again, you could memorize the, that formula, negative quantity b squared minus 40c over 4a, or you could just remember what? Correct. So we're going to evaluate the function at the horizontal coordinate. So that is to say we want to evaluate h at um, 2.5. Okay, so that's beyond my arithmetic abilities. So negative 16 times 2.5 squared plus 80 times 2.5 plus 40, 140. So that means 
that um, the ball reaches a maximum height of 140 feet at what time? At two and a half seconds. So now I want you to draw a sketch of what has occurred. So something like this. So this is T, this is H, so how high does it start? It starts at 40, right? Because this is, this is like where you're standing on the building. And then time proceeds, and then from here, does it go up or down? It goes up, and it goes up until it reaches the vertex. And where does the vertex occur? Right, at, at 2.5 comma 140. So this is not the scale, but that's okay. Okay, so then it goes up. And then it goes back down. Okay, so now there's another point in the story I want us to find now. What's, what point do you think I want us to find now? Yeah, when does it hit the ground? So now, that's when it hits the ground. So now my, my request of you is in part five, when does it hit the ground? Okay, so that's a perfectly understandable English sentence, but how do you translate this into a, a mathy sentence? Okay. Right. When does the output when is the output zero? So I want you to solve an equation. So I want you to solve H of T equal to zero. Okay. So negative sixteen T squared and then plus 80t plus 40 is equal to 0. So it's a quadratic equation. So before we do anything else, I want to simplify it as much as I can. So what's one obvious simplification I can do? Well, yes. I, even We can do better than that even. Divide by 8, right? In fact, I'm going to divide by negative 8 so that the leading coefficient is positive. So if I divide by negative 8, then it would be 2t squared and then minus 10t and then minus 5. So I divided by negative 8. Okay, now, so this is a quadratic and we want to solve it. Do we want to use the factor by grouping method or do we want to use the quadratic formula? factor by grouping. Okay, so we want we want something whose product is the product of the first and the last. So negative 10. And whose sum is what? Also negative 10. So we want something whose product is negative 10 and whose sum is negative 10. So how about um, how about 1 and negative 10? What's the sum? Negative 9. Okay, that's not going to work. How about 2 and negative 5? What's the sum? Negative 3. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's not going to work. Okay, we're not going to be able to do the factor by grouping thing, right? So if we can't do the factor by grouping thing, then what? Okay. Quadratic formula.
So then T, the formula is, in terms of letters A, B, and C, is negative B plus or minus square root B squared minus 4AC, all divided by 2A. Notice there's the discriminant. No surprise there. But I'd like to point out something that may be just slightly surprising. And that is, what if the discriminant was 0? Then what is that? And, and how do you say it out loud? Negative B over 2A. That's three times I've done it today. Because what's, what's the important thing about teaching? Repetition, Repetition right? <laughs> so negative B over 2A. So it's not surprising, right, that it's showing up there, I think. No, I'm, su I'm saying supposing that it was 0. If, if the discriminant was 0, then that formula would be negative B over 2A. OK. Um, OK, so now we have to do this. So then this would be um, negative, negative 10 plus or minus the square root of negative 10 squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 5, and then divide this by 2 times 2. And then carrying out that arithmetic, <coughs> that would be t is equal to 10 plus or minus, and then t negative 10 squared, well, that's 100. And then I can see that I'm going to be doing addition here. So then 4 times 2 is 8 times 5 is 40. So that would be square root 140. And then divide by 4. So now, could someone please tell me, why did the factor by grouping thing not work? I claim that it, it should be obvious to you now why factor by grouping did not work. It's not that. Yes, it is something to do with this. Alternatively, what what? There you have it. So if this, if the disc, the discriminant is 140. If the discriminant was 144, then it would then then we would have been able to factor by grouping because what's the square root of 144? 12. If it was 169. That would have been fine, too, because then, then the square root of the discriminant would have been 13. But the square root of the discriminant is not rational. It's not a rational number. So then that's why the factor by grouping thing didn't work. But, but do notice and be comforted that the quadratic formula will, in fact, always work. So that means that there's two solutions. t is 10 minus the square root of 140 over 4 or t is 10 plus the square root of 140 over 4. But I claim this is not in agreement with the story. OK, why do you say that? So what do you mean, positive 1? Uh, the one on the right side. This, so, so this one is positive. I think we can all agree that that one's positive. But why is this one not positive? Right. So, so 140, that's bigger than 100. So the square root of 140 is bigger than 10. So this is 10 minus something bigger than 10. So this is negative. So the only answer is the positive one. 10 plus square root 140 over 4. So if we go back to the drawing, <coughs> if we go back to the drawing, what's this, what is this right here? Right, this, this is time. t is equal to 10 plus square root 140 over 4. But I have a question for you. Where is 10 minus the square root of 140 over 4? Right, it's if, it's, it's if we were, this is, this is a piece of a parabola. If you were to watch this, a ball thrown under these conditions, it would, it would trace out this arc. 
and it's not it's not reasonable because you time doesn't run backwards. But if if you did run time backwards, that's the other solution, right there. Okay, good. So any question about this exercise? Yes. What if this were a question on homework or a quiz, and we put a decimal or a fraction instead of? Yeah. Well, it would depend. If the if the if the I'll be clear in the instructions. So if I say give me the exact answer, then I don't want a decimal. But if I do want a decimal, I'll be clear and say give it to me to however many places past the decimal is necessary to make the answer unambiguous. Okay, good. Let's do another one. These are so fun. So no no question, no section about quadratics would be complete without talking about farmers. So here we go. Suppose that we have a backyard. And it's a rectangular backyard. And that this is the back fence. And then in the rectangular backyard, we want to construct a garden. And that garden is going to be rectangular. <laughs> So we're going to construct a rectangular garden in our rectangular yard. And what we have is we have, we have 80 feet of garden fence. And we'll use the back fence as one side of the garden. So if I draw this, the fence that we have in red, what I'm saying is we're going to build a rectangular fence that looks like this. And we have 80 feet of fence with which to do it. So, and you can imagine that the that the the backyard is a rectangle that's just enormous. It's much much wider than 80 feet going in both directions. Okay, so then we could we could make an, a garden that has 0 square feet by <laughs> by just by just you know <laughs> doing 80 linear feet of fence that way and it doesn't actually come out this way at all. That would not be a useful garden. Right? Also, we could, instead of making it a long strip this way, we could make it a long strip that way. Just, just, just build a fence just straight out, but it doesn't contain anything. Okay, or we could build some intermediate thing that actually does contain some area. And my question to you is, is, well, what dimension should we choose so that we maximize the area contained by our fence? Not quite. So if we call this L, and we call this W, then my first request of you is I want you to find a formula, formula for the area in terms of L only. So presently, if we call the area A, then I think we can all agree that the area would be length times width. But does this satisfy the requirements of the question? No, because it says L only. So what I'd like for you to do is tell me, how can I eliminate W? Well, then W would just be on the other side. And the equation would still have W. Here. How can I get rid of the W? Ah, so we know, we know that if that's L, then what's this one? L. So how much fence do we use? We use L plus W plus L. So we know that 2L plus W is 80. So could we solve for W in this one? 
Yeah, so we could get W is 80 minus 2L. And then we could <coughs> take this 80 minus 2L and we could substitute it into that W. Okay, I'm almost done. I need 30 seconds. So then if we do that, we have L multiplied by 80 minus 2L. And so let's simplify this. 80 is 2L squared plus 80L. So is it only L's now? That's good. Now, does this pass the reasonableness te test with what I've written? Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Notice that this is a quadratic in L. How does this quadratic open presently? At the way it's presently written, it opens up. So making this error right here is not forgivable. It's forgivable if this was an abstract problem. But this is not forgivable because you're saying that the area is unbounded above. Okay? So the, the mistake was is that this is L times negative 2L, so here's a negative. Okay, so the question I want you to do in your own time now is I want you to find the maximum area and the dimensions which are necessary to, to do that. So dimensions. So when you find the maximizer of this A, that'll give you L, but what do you not have, notably? W. w. So I want you to also find W. Have a nice weekend.